Hi all, welcome to the second webinar in our Collegiate Recovery Academy webinar series. My name is Sydney Chaifetz. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Safe Campuses at Safe Project. So what is Safe Project? SAFE is a national nonprofit organization. We have four main initiatives. Um, those are safe communities, safe campuses, safe workplaces, and safe veterans. Purely for the sake of time, I won't go into detail into what each initiative does, but I strongly encourage you to learn more about everything that SAFE does um, at our website, that's safeproject.us to learn more. So tonight we're here on behalf of the Safe Campuses Initiative. So within Safe Campuses, our mission is to normalize recovery on campuses across the nation. We do this through providing technical assistance um, to staff and administrators and student leaders from across the country through the Collegiate Recovery Leadership Academy. So we're here tonight on behalf of the Collegiate Recovery Leadership Academy. The CRLA is an academic year-long fellowship program for students in recovery and also recovery allies. These fellows work on a project throughout the year on their campus and in their community that impacts collegiate recovery in some way. Through this fellowship opportunity, they also attend events, and this webinar series is, is one such event. Um, they also attend uh, two in-person events with us, a summit each year and a retreat each year. Um, they receive mentorships from folks kind of in the field across the country um, and a, a whole variety of, of learning opportunities through this webinar. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Robin to introduce herself and a little bit more about um, our time together tonight. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Robin Bilodeau and I use the pronoun she, her, hers. And I am a graduate of the 2021-2022 CRLA and a person in uh, recovery. I'm currently a graduate student at Winston-Salem State University and I'm getting my master's in occupational therapy. So for tonight's webinar, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A uh, button. It's right there. It should be right there at the bottom. And we're going to work to try to answer all the questions as they come in and closer to the end. We'll try to make sure we get everything answered. I'm honored to have the opportunity tonight to introduce our speakers. We are so excited to learn more about university structure and funding with Tyler Rines and Lily Ettinger. Lily Ettinger currently serves as the director of the Center for Students in Recovery at the University of Texas at Austin. Tyler Rines is a relationship builder, a major fundraiser, and a nonprofit sector leader, and currently serves at Safe Project. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to them so we can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Robin, and hi, friends. Thank you for joining us. We're thrilled that you're here with us this evening. Uh, many of you are CRLA fellows yourself or allies on campuses working in behavioral health, mental health, student affairs, and we're just thrilled to be presenting on fundraising and university structure to help you drive a lot of the you know, social and cultural and political change that um, we all count on in our shared mission here to save and change lives. Um, so I'm leading off with fundraising 101 and sharing as much as I can in uh, the nearly 10 years I've been doing this work in about 20 minutes. So get ready, buckle up. Um, the first thing that we wanted to start off with is just getting uh, a feel or a gauge for your fundraising experience. If you've ever done anything, whether that's, you know, a Facebook, um, Facebook fundraiser or, you know, selling cookies or, you know, chocolate bars as a kid or direct major or annual giving work. So we're going to put up a poll here. Give us a second. All right. Right. Folks are filling it out. We're about halfway. Yeah. 
Right, that's almost everybody. Oh, wow, we have a couple of folks that have high fundraising experience, which is great. Um, but uh, all right, so about 17% of you have no fundraising experience, which is A-OK. -okay. Uh, half of you about low experience, a quarter medium, and a couple of outliers there in the high experience, which is fantastic. Um, right. So let's get into it. For those of you that said little to no experience, that's okay. Fundraising is about relationships and it's about passion. It's about sharing your passion and exciting and igniting passion in others. So this is a quote from Jerry Panas, who is kind of a rock star in the fundraising field. I think he's in his late 80s or early 90s now, and he's raised over $11 billion in his career. And it all kind of centers back to human relationships and passion. So as long as you keep that in mind, you're well on your way. And just knowing what I know about behavioral health and recovery, um, you all or have that in spades, or at least your allies in are hungry to learn more. So cultivate that passion. Right. So this here is some wisdom that was shared with me by my late mentor, Lisa Mann, who I worked with at James Madison's Montpelier, the historic home of James and Dolly Madison. He did a lot of great fundraising for civics um, and civic education, and uh, she really, I was very nervous going into this field, and she she really instilled in me that it's it's truly about the human connection. The, the most effective fundraisers, they, they have an inner sense of calm, they radiate joy, and they live to inspire passion in others. And you really got to not stress about the money. You need to be cognizant of the money and know what you want to use the money for and be well aware of your projects and your goals, but really lean on cultivating human relationships and human connection. Um, Lisa was wonderful, and uh, I live with this advice every day. And so authentic human connection really is the bedrock of all nonprofit and charitable, charitable work. It's the reason we're here. It's the reason we ask, and it's the reason folks give. Gifts of all sizes, from $5 to $5 million and more. Um, and relationship building is so essential in, in this work, regardless of your cause, regardless of your background, or what organization you're raising funds for. Um, remember, it's about relationships. And we're fortunate to be in this field um, because folks need us and we wanna help them. And so keeping your, your passion going is really, is really essential. However, I'm well aware that there's a lot of compassion fatigue in this line of work in behavioral and mental health. And so sometimes your flame will, will flicker and it might dwindle down, but it will still burn. And you'll have moments where it's it's a blaze when you get a big gift or you launch a new center or a new program. And there are so many different uh, sectors and areas where philanthropic funds and charitable dollars are directed. Um, but life-saving and life-changing work is really what resonates the most with folks. And so we're fortunate to be in a field where that's exactly what we do. That's what Safe Project is about. That's our bread and butter. And we do it across those uh, four initiative areas uh, Sydney mentioned. Um, but your, your donors also are going to care about saving and changing lives. Um, they, this, these quotes here are from uh, Clement Stone who uh, lived well into his 90s and gave away almost $300 million in his life. And this is just some kind of, some fodder from the field. Um, I need to hear the problem is urgent, something that needs to be solved immediately. And if it's exciting and makes me tingle, the institution is well on its way to getting my gift. And then kind of um, funnily says, all I wanna do is save the world. 
now and for future generations. In my giving, I'm eager to support organizations that have the same kind of mission I do. I wouldn't consider giving to something I didn't believe in, not even a small gift. And so this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of getting to know your donors and aligning their philanthropic vision and goals with your organization's goals. Fundraisers are more matchmakers and relationship builders um, than solicitors. Of course, we do that work, but you need to hear your donors out and you really, really need to listen. Listen more than you talk. And so this, this kind of hits home the point that mission matters. Uh, Marianne McDonald, um, her father founded Zenith Radio Corporation, and she gave a $3 million gift uh, some decades ago to found a substance use uh, organization at Scripps Memorial Hospital. Um, and so it, it, really, it really drives the point home that if you're not connecting with what your donor wants, it, it, it doesn't matter uh, how good your metrics are, how out there you are. You really need to meet your donors where they're at. And so this organization was able to capitalize on her interests and her passion and her goals. Um, she had familial experience losing a daughter and watching her mother um, suffer um, through AUD and SUD. And so that's why uh, she used this large leadership gift to, to found an organization that was going to do something about it. And I did some uh, reading on this and it was a 50 bed facility and served over 20,000 people. It's since moved to another hospital, but again, you know, their, their flame flickered, but it didn't go out. Um, they were met with some challenges, some restructuring at one hospital and Marion didn't let it die. She moved it to another hospital and she helped friend raise and fundraise to get that done. Donors are very, especially major donors, they're very good at reading people. They're called on a lot. Um, some, some donors uh, like to refer to major gift officers as piranhas. Um, I had a colleague that was known by one of the richest women in the world um, as her favorite piranha. So it's kind of, you know, backhanded, but you, they, can, they can read if you're genuine. They can read if you have integrity, but most importantly, they can read if your passion and your heart is in the right place. And I, I know that all of your heart is in the right place. So really, you know, bring your goals, bring your visions, bring your passion, and do your homework um, when you're about to make an ask. Again, don't push, inspire, listen, truly listen, and find common ground and common purpose. Match what you and your organization in a lot of your cases, it'll be campus recovery communities or programs, CRCs and CRPs, with what donors are, are looking to accomplish. And the only way to do that is to meet with them, to get out there, to, to sit down over coffee, um, to, to go on a walk with them. Um, there's, there's no shortage of ways that you can start to build these relationships. Um, and again, um, really listen, be there to guide them. Um, be ready when the conversation shifts to a potential opportunity that you have that aligns with something you want to accomplish. Don't go in there with the kitchen sink and tell them the whole history and every single program and subprogram you do. Um, these quotes kind of illustrate that point. Um, just be genuine, be yourself, and, and don't push. Uh, they, they can smell that a mile away. And so I like to really distill this down to embracing the three E's. Um, donors want to embrace. They want to see, feel, and hear your energy, your enthusiasm, and your empathy. And again, sometimes the compassion fatigue will grind you down, um, but you know, keep swinging because uh, persistence pays off, especially in philanthropic work. You will hear no way more than you hear yes. I'm talking like 20 to one, but that one out of 20, you know, when it's a $100,000 gift or a quarter of a million or a million, 
that's that's why you got to keep your head and your heart in the game. So if nothing else, <laughs> remember the three E's, energy, enthusiasm, and empathy. And uh, empathy is something I come across a lot. I was a plan giving officer in prior roles, so helping folks give gifts from their estates um, through charitable gift annuities, bequests, gifts from their will or their life insurance. And I really got to know a lot of these folks, dozens of folks in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of those folks passed away during my, my professional relationship with them, oftentimes blossoming into a friendship with them. And the big payout usually came, but I was missing my friend. So, you know, empathy is something that you will carry with you. And that's also something donors can see and then smell a mile away. If you're being genuine, if you are garnering and cultivating authentic human connections. This is something I've, I've said a lot. I'll say it again, listening is key. It's, it's essential. Listen, listen intently, listen even more intently and sell the dream, not the project. And that goes back to the point about not getting too far into the weeds. Sell the mission, sell the vision. Talk broadly about the work, especially in early meetings. Be ready to answer the detailed questions if they go there. Um, and most often they will, but don't lead with that. Don't lead with um, a bunch of hyperbole or a bunch of statistics. Have them in your back pocket. Um, let them drive the conversation. And so this leads me to asking you all, you know, what are your dreams? What does your campus need? What kind of change do you want to drive in the behavioral and mental health and substance use space? Um, how do you want your CRC to serve? Um, what programs do you want the CRC to be involved with? Um, and then, you know, further along that, that line, you know, what, what is your project budget? What are these programs going to cost? And do you have a wish list? And Lily will talk about wish lists a little bit later in her section. These are just some overall stats for me to convey a really important message that it, it's been like this, I'm telling you, for 40 or 50 years. It ebbs and flows a little bit, but the vast majority of gifts are made by individuals, people like you and me. And then, you know, it's, it's incredible. 68% uh, of giving last year, the last year we have statistics, 2021 came from individuals. Um, see that corporation? Folks often want corporate, spark, uh, corporate sponsorships. They think big corporations, they wanna go there first. 4% of the nearly $500 billion that was given away in that year came from corporations. So keep that in mind. And then also look at the foundation line. Grants are important. There's big grants, small grants. There are federal grants, state level grants. Um, family foundation grants, big national foundation grants, but all of those collectively are less than 20% of charitable dollars. Um, so just put that, I just want to put that into perspective. I think grant seeking is very important and you should definitely fold that into a robust and diversified uh, fundraising approach, but really get to know the people on your campus and in your community and in the Tri-County area, get to know the people. Look at other nonprofits that are similar to yours or look at your university's donor list. Study the names, uh, get to know people that know those people because individuals really move the needle in fundraising. And if you factor in um, bequest giving, you know we're looking at like over 75% is from individuals. This is just um, the same uh, information sliced differently. Where's the money going? Um, big sector shifts here. You know, uh, where was the money directed that year? Uh, fortunately, uh, human services, where we all live, work, and play, as thirteen percent. But uh, public health certainly uh, interplays with what we do, as does education. So we're looking at about 35% of all dollars are, are up for grabs. That's the sandbox that we can play in philanthropically. This is a pictorial representation of the different activities that fundraisers do. Oftentimes you're doing all of these at once and different people are at different stages. 
and it's revolving. So you're always looking for new donors, doing your identification. Then you're having initial meetings or phone calls to qualify them to see if there's clues about their passion and inclination to give. Just because someone has capacity and is a multi-millionaire or billionaire doesn't mean they have the inclination to give. Those two things need to go in tandem. So that's where doing your prospect research and qualification comes in. Cultivation is what the beginning of the presentation was all about, cultivating authentic human connection, getting to know them. Um, if they like theater, you know, go see a production with them. Really treat them like individuals. Listen to them and what they want. Solicitation, that's asking. Stewarding is thinking. And that has to go beyond a simple thank you letter. Do a handwritten card. Pick up the phone. Um, send them a message on their birthday. Send them a social media message. Um, one of the gold standards in fundraising is seven stewardship touches. So try to thank donors at least seven times in seven different ways throughout the year. The more you thank them, the more it will pay off uh, in dividends in furthering that relationship. And maybe if they have the capacity and inclination, moving that person that gives a hundred bucks up to $100,000. And then maybe moving that person into a plan giving donor as well and getting a multi-million dollar gift uh, from their estate. Um, this is multi-year work. And sometimes a major gift, even a 50 or $100,000 gift takes at least 18 months of cultivation. So this is all going on all the time. I encourage you all to get organized and make yourself a pipeline. This is a sample pipeline. And at the end of the presentation, there's a link to this very spreadsheet. It's broken up so it fits on the screen. If you don't have a CRM uh, or a software program like Blackbaud or Razor's Edge, maybe your university does, or maybe they won't give you access. You can do this with a simple spreadsheet and you can start here. Simple stuff, name, where do they work? email, phone number, um, what uh, comments from recent visits, um, the last action, your next action. It's just getting you organized so that you can keep these moves going. This is about moves management. Um, contact reports are essential. Um, it's just the download from a call or a meeting and keep them brief. Remember the most important points, and this will help you convey to your partners, uh, your colleagues at the university, or you know other officers or managers in your CRC or campus community, what's going on with this donor. Keep them highly confidential, just the basics, uh, what was discussed, what are they interested in funding, what's their background, and this way you don't have to keep rehashing the same conversations more on contact reports, some of the big bulleted items that would go in there. We talked a little bit about diversifying your fundraising strategies through gifts from individuals, small annual gifts, major gifts. Consider monthly giving options, lots of different types of grants. In-kind support will be huge for campus projects and CRCs and CRPs, free rooms, free pizza, free services, free printing, you could definitely use that, especially as you're starting up. And many of you won't have 501c3 nonprofit status. Just take whatever you can get to build your program. This is just a reminder, and I'm gonna start speeding up here. <laughs> just a reminder that there's so many different kinds of grants. There's 26 federal grant making agencies and there's sub granting agencies under them all. These are really the only ones that kind of apply to the work we do, SAMHSA being one of the biggest, um, which is under Health and Human Services, a little bit of HUD, especially with uh, recovery housing. And fortunately, we're seeing more Department of Justice um, grants coming online for restorative justice and harm reduction work, um, which we're, we're pleased about. Um, but this is also a reminder um, really, really focus on individuals first. And if you are going for grants, I really, I, I highly recommend community foundations in your area. Um, they're, they're, they are often a lot of, a lot easier to apply to, less red tape and more locally rooted. Um, 
Here's a brief definition. Again, it's mainly, uh, they're geographic specific, focused on the geography where you are at. Um, submission statements from some of the community foundations in your area, because I looked at the participation and registration list, and you'll just see some things that, that pop out about what community foundations are all about. You know, they want to help folks in their community realize their dreams of making lasting impact in their community, create enduring solutions to complex problems. Sounds like things we want to do and what we're about and lifting each other up in times of hardship. And I won't go into this now, but you should go back to the recording and and uh, and click on the links because I curated all of your institutions and the community foundations that line up with your universities or colleges or nonprofit organizations. Apologies if I missed one, but um, that's really good fodder to get you started in your fundraising journey. And then I really want you all to at least explore collaborating with your college and university advancement and fundraising departments. Um, a lot of them have dozens of folks just like me that have portfolios of hundreds of donors and they have contact reports going back years. They have a treasure trove of information for you to tap into. And oftentimes there'll be folks that come across their desk or radar that have them scratching their heads. They, they might not know what to do if someone's into substance use or mental health. It might not be a natural fit. And they might have notes in their contact reports or in their files about these outliers. I encourage you to build internal relationships to get to know who these folks are. And if they don't track that, ask them to start doing it. Ask them to start tracking folks with affinity for substance use, mental health, and behavioral health, and ask if they would like to collaborate with you. Uh, my experience uh, in working with university fundraisers, uh, my previous organization, was a sister institution of University of Chicago, we would share credit on gifts all the time. So they would probably be open to doing that with you. And the last thing I'll leave you with is be brave, be yourself and you know make the ask. So many people, and I'm talking like founders, board chairs, CEOs, they, they're finicky about asking and you, you'll be surprised what you don't get what you don't ask for. You know, be brave do your homework and, and make the ask. And now I'm gonna kick it over to Lily, who has a different path than me, who hasn't worked at large uh, institutions doing major gifts fundraising, but really in the trenches grassroots fundraising and building these types of programs from the ground up. And I'm really excited and I have my notebook and I'm ready to learn from Lily. Hope you are too. Awesome, thank you so much, Tyler. I'm gonna echo exactly uh, what Tyler ended with of making the ask, because uh, at one point, just a couple of years into my uh, career in collegiate recovery, we asked somebody for two and a half million dollars. Uh, and I that was like everything I could imagine dreaming of for like five years. And they said yes. And I really wish I'd asked for five. Um, and so and I know that sounds like absolutely insane, uh, because most of us are like, I want a pizza budget. But uh, that's yeah, learning how to make those asks and hiding how terrified you might be making that ask is a very important skill. Um, but to get there, I got to navigate a lot of university structure. And so if Tyler's going to run slides for me. So this is my fun first question of what does your university look like? Um, and I know many of y'all's probably first thoughts are, oh, you know, it's this kind of campus, this kind of campus. I'm actually not asking that question. Uh, this picture, by the way, is from an event that actually happened yesterday in our Collegiate Recovery's main room. We partnered with the harm reduction organization on campus called SHIFT and our university uh, Panhellenic group to do some recovery and harm reduction work about uh, an upcoming big all Greek festival that, that has a lot of uh, high risk behavior. So that was really fun for us to get to do and use our space like after our normal hours for. But uh, really, what does your university look like? Uh, so if it doesn't look like this, what I'm really talking about is on our next slide. And org charts. I know that y'all are like, what? And this, these are just three, I typed in university org charts and just pulled some of the publicly facing ones because I didn't want to give away 
the ones at my university that are like behind intranet walls. Org charts are one of my best friends. Uh, when I search, when I did my like last job search, because I've been at UT for only almost eight months now, I was at Baylor University before this. Um, I asked for org charts uh, in my in my meetings, in my interviews, because org charts tell me a lot about what's going on in university. A lot of times we think, oh, well, I should just go immediately to the highest rung. The highest rung may not be the person uh, that you're actually looking for. And sometimes org charts can really tell us like where things get done. Um, it's often surprising to find that a university might have construction services different from facilities, different from custodial services. Those might all be in completely different areas. Um, and so this is a question I like to ask people is how well do you know your university? So we're gonna have a poll on that actually. It should come up soon. I am, yeah. I appreciate these answers so much. Because um, the question, it's organized. I, um, I'll say I went to, I worked at the same institution that I transferred and did both my undergraduate and graduate work at. And I had no idea until I was a staff member about half of what was going on. And it looks actually like half of y'all, a little bit more than half of you are like, there's an organization to this giant mess. And the other half of y'all are like, know where to find the secrets. I appreciate that. Uh, and this is my small child that I will be getting more milk for in a minute when I am done presenting. Is it okay? Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> She's a little giggly fish right now. Um, so awesome. I think that's a lot of y'all. So we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah. So org chart. Um, these are kind of questions that I like to ask when I'm thinking about an org chart. Um, what are the rules about navigating an org chart? Um, one of the big things I like to say is wherever you start, uh, don't skip levels. Yeah. There are two types of educations that you'll get in most uh, institutes of higher education. And one is like what you learn in your class, but the other is what you get to learn about how do entrenched structures actually work. Um, so if you go say, talk to a coordinator about your future recovery program, it's not in your best interest to immediately go talk to like the university president. Um, that will stress everybody out. Everybody, everybody will be stressed out. Um, that coordinator, may know that they need to approach things a very specific way with their supervisor and their supervisor and their supervisor for this to like be a palatable thing. Um, and so in every university, it'll be slightly different. Some universities way flatter than others. Some university basically wants everyone to be a manager of one other person. Um, and there's lots of different reasons for the, how that works in different places. But for those of y'all who are starting collegiate recovery programs, uh, collegiate recovery student organizations, wherever you are, I like to ask two big questions, these next two. One is where would you belong on an org chart near university right now? Would you belong in your student affairs, like student org groups? Would you belong with your counseling center, wellness center, in your school of social work as like an academic subunit? Where do you belong right now? Maybe you don't even know that you belong. Um, and there generally is pretty much a place for everything at uh, Collegiate in the world of higher ed. But the next question is, where do you want to belong and why? Because where you are on an org chart, like which, you know, if you report to the Dean of Students, you may have very different rules than if you report to, you know, the Dean of a Health and Wellness who oversees a health center and a counseling center. There might be very different expectations about what kind of revenue you bring in or where your funding comes from, or even how your place, your facilities get paid for. So learning those kind of things, and I know that seems very overwhelming. Um, it's actually, once you get talking to people and learn these, like some of these things, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and every university is a little different, I will say that, which is why I can't tell you, oh, it's exactly this way. Um, but finding where you want to belong can be really important as you try to build something that's sustainable. Looking for an office that's been around for a while can often be very helpful compared to maybe something that's only been around for a year and might disappear or there's a couple I worked at in my previous institution had a, an office that would exist for five years disappear for two exist for five years so you knew that if you wanted to start something new that might not be the place to do it um, given how the university's politics approached that particular department 
what is the real seat of decision making power that you need to have to do what you want to do right now? Is what you need to do right now, figure out how to rent the same room every week so you can have a recovery meeting or just a recovery hangout space in that room. That is a very different type of decision making power you need versus maybe you just need someone who can buy pizza for you guys every week. Maybe you need somebody who can help you get your name out at orientation. Um, so what kind of decision making power do you need to have and where does that decision making power actually come from? And again, I'll talk about uh, particularly like finding a location. If you wanna have the same room every week, it's incredible who you might be asking for that. Um, and so we'll talk about that. So uh, what kind of power do you need and what responsibility do you want to avoid? At my current institution, um, we are our own department. We're one of nine departments. So there's me in our like office, but like seven people uh, <clears throat> who work for us from like undergrad through professional staff and university and housing and dining of a 50,000 you know, person uni university. We're both considered equal departments in terms of just being departments. Um, the interesting part about that is because of that, I am also a building manager, one of like seven in my space. Uh, so if some facilities issue comes around, I actually have to spend a lot more time and responsibility doing that. The upside to that is I can do whatever I want with my space, including painted colors that are not university colors. Um, but sometimes there are types of responsibility that we really aren't interested in having. If you don't want to figure out how to pay your ITS a phone bill every month, that's the type of level of responsibility you want to avoid. And that's okay. It's okay to be like, yeah, that's I don't need that level of power or that level of detail. Um, just learning what you do need and what might actually take so much time from you, it removes your ability to do your mission. And org charts really can begin to tell you the story of all of these things. Um, and they're also really great if you're a history nerd. They're great to tell you the history of how your university grew. Um, so I'll kind of move to the next page um, if that works. Yes, so space remodel. One of the things that when I was hired, I was told immediately that we were doing is gonna be remodeling our space. Um, and so how many different people do you think we had to deal with just to get new paint and new carpet and a little bit of new furniture? Um, and how many different areas of the university did they come from? Again, so we thankfully did have a project manager um, who was part of the university, but we also had to deal with a designer. Uh, that designer could show us carpets and paints and furniture that fit and worked with the purchasing team because you guys may not know this, your university signs contracts with certain people. So sometimes you want to buy something, you can only buy it from certain people. Those university contracts are already set in stone. Um, and so that can be a very uh, confusing process until you find somebody who's part of a purchasing team for your university. And, and some universities make that very centralized and some decentralized. Um, where do you put all the stuff that you have? Um, do you have a materials management team or a warehouse team? You know, who's going to come in and install things? Who's going to come take away old things? Uh, who's going to tell you if things are ADA compliant or just health and safety compliant? Um, environmental health and safety will. Uh, they work with everybody from like all your chemistry labs. Uh, but if you have a raccoon fall through your ceiling and pee in your cabinets, which we have had happen <laughs> as well, uh, environmental health and safety is a very good number to have on hand, you <laughs> Um, who's custodial support? Uh, this was a fun one. Uh, so blood and pee were covered by environmental health and safety uh, because this poor raccoon who was found alive and is totally fine and happily somewhere else, uh, you know, lived in our space for four days without being discovered. Um, environmental health and safety covers blood and pee. Uh, who, on the other hand, is covered by custodial support. Um, I didn't make this distinction, but that is the distinction. So we had to learn, you know, who covers what in all these strange types of situations uh, because there were liquid rules of all things. Um, accounting and budget management, that's a big one. Who actually gets to tell you the budget you have and how you can spend it? Um, and that can be everyone from the coordinator you're working with, from your department, if you get to become part of a department. There are just so many things. Who's, you know, your building manager? It, how many building managers might you have? Is this their full-time job or is this just an added responsibility to their job? What kind of power does a building manager have? Um, Bijo, 
at UT, a building manager can choose what colors, you know, are allowed to be painted on the walls. Like they can really enforce a uniformity. Or if you are in a building like the one that we're in, uh, we're kind of like the room of requirement for UT in our lovely, amazing building uh, that houses other departments as well. Uh, and every department gets to do whatever they want. It's great. But every department has their own building manager. Um, and the space coding office. Um, this is one of my favorite kind of stories. Um, We've talked about all these offices, but uh, every every piece of your campus is mapped in a software somewhere. And this may seem like no big deal. If you've ever had to use software like Ad Astra, which is one of the most common ones for student orgs to reserve spaces on campus, um, you'll see that like that will just tell you about spaces that you can reserve. But every space on every campus is very clearly marked about what it is, who owns it, what type of space it's coded as, all of these things happen. And you never know where this comes from. But this actually, this office helped us at UT uh, save a lot of money because we were able to argue that our space had been incorrectly coded and how it's coded depends on how much of your facilities costs UT pays for. So things like this that you don't think would matter at all can matter a lot. Um, and and it just requires asking questions and just being curious about all of the nooks and crannies and secrets that your university might find. And again, I love this one because of all people, it was somebody in the provost's office who got to tell us and recode our space for us, which none of these other people, none of the project managers, designers, purchasing, none of these other people could do for us. Accounting couldn't fix this for us, but it was an office manager in a the provost office who was able to change this for us. So that is kind of a fun example of how university structures can change things. And then we're gonna go to the next slide. Um, uh, so making friends. All of these people are my friends now, uh, except for environmental health and safety because they did not like being called for cleaning up raccoon blood. Hey, Caroline. Mom. Yeah. Well, I'm in the bomb and a big heart in the middle. Wow. And this is my necklace. Okay. Hey, I'm almost done. Can I keep talking for a little bit? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and then my brother. Yeah. So we had two babysitters fall through today, y'all. Um, but use that A game. Use all those skills that you'll use with other fundraisers, with people at your university. When I get to check who's donated to our program, it always astounds me that a number of our small donors are actually other people at our university, people that I know. Um, and it's something I'm incredibly grateful for. These are my coworkers who don't just support me through the day, but then go home and spend some of our higher ed paychecks on supporting our program. That's huge. Uh, and that's something that I just don't know that you guys could ever ask for you know anything more. It's a really nice thing. Again, that room scheduler, You've got to be nice. You've, you've got to make friends with everyone because it could be a student worker or an administrative associate or an office manager or somebody in the provost's office. Like it is incredible uh, who might be the person who gets to actually have that power to put you in the same room, make it easy for you to have that same space over and over again, or may make it really difficult for you to build community in your time here. And again, I know I've said it before follow that org chart unless you're invited. Don't start a conversation with somebody who might be a coordinator and jump to the president unless invited. <laughs> Again, it can make things really difficult for a lot of people. And for better or worse, those are just how university politics work. Um, a fun one that I know I have to say and I uh, in writing is a lot of us are idealists at heart. I know that I am. What I wish I would be able to do in my role, some of those things are not legal in the state that I do them. Uh, that I live in. I don't do those things. I follow state law. Um, if you have a passion for a certain thing, whether that is how naloxone is handled in your state or how certain resources are handled in your state, um, asking people to do illegal things uh, while they are doing their job, uh, it can make people nervous. A large part of our job as we are seeking to make friends across campus to build rapport, to build our communities, to build our programs is building trust. We can't build trust when we ask people to do illegal things, even if it's the right thing, even if it's you know a moral thing. Uh, I just like to say, it's not a thing that builds trust. Um, 
and ask questions. I ask people questions all of the time um, and it has resulted in a number of great things. Um, and those questions can be personal questions. What are your hobbies? Those questions can be also, I was in a meeting uh, with a four other departments yesterday and we asked, what's your favorite secret hack on campus? Um, and I learned a lot about where every private restroom is on our campus. Um, and I also learned many other things, but that was what I was most interested in taking with me from that particular uh, icebreaker. But asking those types of questions uh, can really expand your own knowledge of your campus, uh, but also give you a chance to share something that may not even be related to what your program is right then, but help people realize like you are a human. Um, and that's a great thing to make friends with. So Tyler wants to keep going. All right, so we've kind of done structure 101. Well, okay, you figured out where you wanna be on the org chart, you figured out what you want, uh, be prepared. Um, so why should somebody support your program? What, and so the CSR is the Center for Students in Recovery. I just use that because that is uh, what we are, but what's the impact of your collegiate recovery program? So why your program? What do you wanna suggest? What are the impacts or facts about that? And then are there different levels? So if we'll move to the next slide, uh, I actually have three examples of this uh, and they're very tiny, sorry. Um, this is part of my wish list. Things I want, expansion of library materials. This is part of what I like to call materials. Well, there's a lot of good books and resources that can help our students in recovery. We don't have a lot right now. I also really wanna be able to hand students like copies of smart workbooks and AA books and you know whatever type of book they want without them having to buy it and knowing that so many of our students are already you know taking out student loans. About a thousand dollars a year is what it would cost me to be able to fund that book giveaway and keeping a couple of new books for a library. So I have a thousand dollar level. I have a five thousand dollar level. Lots of universities don't mind having kind of five year funds. Or if you really want to help me out, uh, you can move all the way into a facilities gift of twenty five thousand will help me fund a renovation of our uh, one of our small group rooms and turn it into like have bookshelves all across the wall. Um, so I have that listed out. Um, this is you know knowing your needs expansion of library materials it's not a pressing need but it's a nice need um another kind of nice desire that i would have is to have computers for our center um and one of the things i really like to put in here is you'll see in notes and additional info uh, that i want to always make sure that i know if it directly relates to any strategic plan for the university for the division that i report to um if I can tell people it relates to strategic plans, it may not be funded by a donor. It may actually be funded by the university because they're interested in seeing how that might work. So that's something I always want to offer people is you might get you know lucky. It might not even have to make it to development or to a donor before somebody in your university decides it's worth funding. Um, and you know, so there are four main areas that I like to say that you should know your needs in. Uh, number one is staffing. If you don't have enough staff to build capacity, there comes a point in time where you might have to say, I'm so sorry, I can't accept any money for any of the things that we want to do programming for because I just don't have the time to plan those events. And I've been there. And being able to tell that to donors has actually been really helpful because some of them have said, oh, well, I really care about this. So how about I fund a graduate student internship so that we can also do this and just add that money in. So know that please always one again like we were saying act with integrity about what you can in fact take from a donor if there's a specific ask um, if you cannot fulfill that because you just don't have the space the ability the time, whatever the issue is that you can't fulfill that uh, be honest because maybe they can also help support whatever it is that's preventing you from being able to accomplish that goal as well uh, so staffing facilities um, materials uh, and programming are kind of my four big things that that I always keep my wish list for. My wish list can range from like paid internship program in the CSR to I want a kitchen that has a, a stove in it uh, because I want to help with our, you know, eating disorder students in the counseling center that we can teach cooking classes. Um, is that because so many of the students overlap? Some of these things are far more likely to happen um, than others. And so that's something that Again, I invite you all to pay attention to, um, but just keep writing the wish list. And again, this is the basics. I keep this in box. 
the people I work with in development, they have a copy of this. They can pull it up at any time. So they always know what I'm thinking. If you want to go to the next slide, I'm going to go fast. Um, staffing and funding. I'm not going to go like too much into this as much. Universities are funded and fund uh, collegiate recovery programs in like every school is different. At Baylor, it started with a graduate student who was me at the time um, and an unrecognized student organization. We had staff uh, on our campus who were not doing any collegiate recovery work, but they were allies um, and they were able to work with development um, who they had a donor who wanted to give to this, even though it didn't exist yet. That person created seed money for a three year full time position um, and the university created a fund for recovery like from the beginning. So it was very, you know, in, a lot of things were institutionalized from the very get go. Um, I had a budget, some of which was already provided by the university from the beginning. We kept our metrics, we kept relationship building. That led to that $2.5 million uh, less than two years later. And that endowed us with a space staff position, another staff position, and a huge, comparatively huge programming budget. Um, and it meant that all of our facilities costs were covered by the institution. Um, Baylor uses the most common type of budgeting, which is called incremental, which is we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but they also have what we call like activity based funding. So if you had something that would meet the needs of the university, they might cover it otherwise. Um, and Baylor was a highly centralized, much smaller school, much smaller than UT Austin. Um, but at UT Austin, the collegiate recovery program. Uh, is going to be 20 next year and for the first 10 years it was fully self-funded year by year uh, by a director who had to raise all of the money so there were some significant ups and downs um, and every year was a bit of a who knows year um, so 10 year it took 10 years for for the program at ut to be institutionalized it is now just something very excited and ut uses a different type of budgeting model called the responsibility centered management model um, again so next slide these are the budgeting types. Really, I'm not going to talk too much. 90% of them are the incremental type. This is your most common. What you got last year is the basis for what you'll get this year. Um, and then responsibility center management is each unit. So it could be department or area will cover its own cost revenues. Um, and this can be like a more competitive unit. So you got to prove your worth a little bit more. Um, the other two aren't as common. So, or just, so if you want to next slide. Um, Here's the thing, when it comes to learning your ask, over or underestimating your work does suggest that you might not know the scope. So again, make friends. Uh, and this can also, again, lead to more in-kind donations like Tyler's talking about. And do the research. When it comes to salaries, I see numbers all over the place. Public institution salaries are available on the internet in many states. You can Google my salary. Um, and so please don't. Um, uh, but. <laughs> But you can. Um, so learn those things uh, and, you know, do that research. Don't shoot for three times what other people on your campus are paid for. Don't ever ask for something that's not a living wage. Um, so I'll keep going because I know we're trying to make sure we finish on time. Uh, and again, I've mentioned this a little bit. A lot of the money you guys might need will be already inside your university. So I know that Tyler talked a lot about opportunities outside, but inside. I have received money from every one of these, actually, except for the sustainability office, but from internal grants. Um, student government, oftentimes their job really is just to hear what students want and pay for it. Um, if you are a student organization, your student activities may actually have a number of different ways for you to earn money, gain money, and they may also be, have a way for you to have a bank account. That's not someone, that's you. That is me. And this is Caroline, y'all. Um, student service fees, there's sometimes a student committee that can choose what to do with those student service fees. Um, parents council, every school has a parents council, be best friends with them too. Similar with your alumni office, because how many of your alumni are in recovery? They're also a great way to get connected with your development office. Um, um, mommy. And then we'll just um, go to the next slide. Um, mommy, mm -hmm. here's a Caroline teacher too. Yeah, Caroline's another teacher. So, and money um, outside mommy, of universities. Question, can we get off this? Okay, hey, can mommy finish up real fast? Okay, why, why are these three killings in the office? That's a great question. Um, if you are approached by a potential donor, um, 
We'll answer those questions in Q&A. And if you want to approach a donor, we like to say, please ask your development team first. Uh, with that, I think we're going to move on to our questions and answers. So, and again, this is the recap. Know your ask, know your partners, know where that money will go, know how you'll collect it. Thank you so much. Lily, Tyler, I have to say, I've worked at a number of universities over the years, and I have learned so much stuff that I really wish I knew while I was doing the work. Um, friends, please put, I know we're, we only have a couple minutes, but please populate the question and answer with any questions um, that you might have for Tyler and Lily um, or comments in the chat. We're very open um, to hearing what y'all have to say. While y'all are populating that, I'm going to put two links in the chat. The first you're, you will see is the link to this survey. Really just let me know how you enjoy it, what additional questions might you have. And the second link is to future CRLA webinars. So we've got one that's coming up in just a couple, um, two weeks, three weeks on harm reduction. Um, moving forward, we'll have uh, other webinars on the history and future of collegiate recovery. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion, collegiate recovery, and uh, mental health addiction in the system. So please check those out and, and sign up for those. I don't see any question answers. Anyone uh, want to plop those in? I know that we're um, running low on time, but, but we do have two brilliant people here to help. So I see here, any advice on how to use and access student activity fees from student clubs and student unions? So I know at the universities I've been at, um, they post a pretty clear way to, to learn those asks on the website. The student government website's a great place. And if not, then going to your, um, and in some places, so in some places, unions is the right office. In some places, they call it student activities. Um, but generally, you'll be able to find who you go ask, and they'll often not require more than like a one sheet type request. Um, and you'll go up in front of a board of students. Um, they'll have a day and a date. Um, and that's like the best way. Finding, especially if you can find a chartered student organization or if you are a chartered student organization, that tends to help. Sometimes it's even a requirement. Um, but that's, yeah. So. Awesome. I see another question here. Um, if you're interested in doing outside fundraising for your collegiate recovery community on your campus, but your university doesn't seem interested, how do you get them interested? How do you show them the importance of collegiate recovery? I'm, I'm gonna jump in and then let Lily go. Um, it really, you, you gotta build relationships. You, you gotta get out there, um, go cross, across different departments, get to know student government, lean on them. You'd be surprised at how much influence a student body president or a student assembly chair uh, or even a representative can have, especially if you, know, you, you present some statistics. Like one in three college students is dealing with a mental health uh, challenge. Uh, oftentimes that's concurring, co-occurring with substance use. And there are, you know, almost a half million college students in recovery in the country right now, and less than 5% of colleges and universities have collegiate recovery programs. Um, this is a very good question because a lot of university leadership, um, they, they are a dry campus or it's, you know, drugs and alcohol aren't allowed. So this doesn't happen here. It's the head of the sand approach and where it's high time we change that and present some hard truths and student government can help you with that. And I, I say this selfishly because I know I was the student assembly chair at my alma mater, Keene State College, tiny little school in New Hampshire, but Colin Daly and I, uh, who was the student body president, and I were in charge of almost a million dollars in funding that we gave out every year to everyone from, you know, um, the young economists and young Republicans and young Democrat clubs to the Harry Potter club. So they could have money to buy rooms to play Quidditch. It, it was kind of everyone got it. And so when there's a real human need like this that we're all a part of, let's rise this tide and speak out and build partnerships. 
The more people that want this, the better. So this goes to sort of the macro stuff of like destigmatization and public awareness and the, the fundamentals of what we're doing. Um, and then, you know, if you get a couple of alumni on your, you know, on your cause too, then that's where real change can happen. Yeah, I see um, one final question or a handful of final questions. Um, someone asked, can you give advice for navigating private institutions of higher education? We're working to move from a student group to an official collegiate recovery program. So um, private institutions are often a lot more tuition dependent. Um, and so Sierra Castedo de Mortel has created one of the most amazing um, documents that can help you figure out how much money your collegiate recovery program can actually save your university by increasing your retention. Uh, is that the way any of us like to think about it? No, but that's somebody's job. And so getting those numbers in front of the person whose job it is to see intention increase and uh, and revenue increase, they can become your friends because of that. Um, and so that's that's been a, that was a very helpful thing to me uh, in, in previous institutions. I hope we have time for one final question. I see here, what if your university isn't interested in outside fundraising for the CRC? Um, I have a horrifying story, which is at my last institution, uh, the first time somebody offered them a significant sum of money for collegiate recovery, they still said no. And those donors went on and gave to another program, another school that had collegiate recovery. Um, and so I, it happens. Uh, most schools are not uh, not there anymore. Most schools are starting to realize that collegiate recovery is something that's easy to fundraise for. Um, and it's something that parents care about. And it's something that uh, students and alumni care about. Um, connecting, it may not be your particular, you know, person who's assigned to help with student affairs for fundraising. It might be someone who does fundraising for the School of Social Work or the School of Ed. Um, again, learning who the different development people are, uh, learning if that person already has a relationship with university development, those can all be side doors in to help your development office uh, be interested if somebody, if a donor directly contacts them. Tyler may have some more advice too. I'm actually typing an answer to Spencer right now. <laughs> if you if you wanna jump on that one while I'm finishing this thought, Lily. I'm, I'm thrilled with the questions. This is great. This is why we're here. Wonderful, y'all. Well, it looks like I think I think we've gotten to everybody's questions. I'll place again in the chat um, the email address for safe campuses, campuses at safeproject.us. Feel free to send us an email and we'll be sure to um, field your questions to to whoever might be best suited to answer them. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Um, please fill out the survey. Um, please check out what other webinars we have coming down the pipeline. Um, we really appreciate y'all for coming tonight and we hope to see you very soon. Thanks everyone.